Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Katherine Garforth from Garforth Education, and this is the Right to Read Initiative. Today, I have the pleasure of having Dr. Jennifer O'Sullivan from Ireland join me. We are going to be speaking about how the Ontario Human Rights Commission Right to Read Public Inquiry Report and Recommendations are not just applicable to Ontario. Canada, North America, they actually have uh, impact around the world. Today, we're going to take a look at that Irish perspective, specifically when it goes into the pre-service teacher training, because that is something that Dr. Sullivan is part of. So thank you for joining me today. Do you want to give the listeners and viewers a little bit of information about who you are and what you do? Sure, Catherine. Thanks. Thanks so much. It's lovely to be here and to be, to be ch chatting with you. Uh, and a big thank you to anyone who's joining us, uh, particularly from Ireland. It's a lovely sunny evening here at six, six o'clock in the evening after a long day in school. So uh, thank you so much to anyone who's joining us. Um, so as Catherine said, I'm Dr. Jennifer O'Sullivan. I'm a teacher educator in a um, in Marino Institute of Education in Dublin, in Ireland. Um, and I work with undergraduate and postgraduate students who are uh, student teachers, they will, they're going to become primary teachers. So I suppose to give a little context, that would be from age four to age 12 is, is the span uh, that a primary teacher would generally work uh, that age group uh, in Ireland. Um, Apart from before I began my work as a teacher educator, I was a teacher myself in, in a junior school here in Ireland or like an, an elementary school, or I suppose to again try to, to bridge. I'll, I'll try and mention ages and things like that as much as possible to make sure we're, we're all in the same wavelength. Um, I worked in a school there. It was a school with a, a very low kind of socioeconomic background. Uh, or, or environment. Um, I completed my PhD in 2019 in the area of phonemic awareness and looking at, you know, children's phonemic awareness entry levels upon uh, entering school uh, and looking at, again, that difference in socioeconomic backgrounds and whether that had any, any impact on, on those levels. Um, I'm past president of the Literacy Association of Ireland. I, I handed the baton over this year, so um, that was a fantastic year. Um, and I'm a uh, on my way to Florida, this time in two weeks, I'll be in the hopefully the Florida Center for Reading Research as a Fulbright Scholar. So uh, I'm heading over there for, for three months to uh, study and research under some of the, the big names or the biggest, more most world renowned names in, in reading research. So I suppose that gives you a little a little snapshot of of my work, uh, particularly here in Ireland. Well, thank you so much for making the time to speak to us. I know there's a lot of information out there and a lot of demands on time. Uh, so I definitely appreciate it. So before we begin, let's you know just talk about what does reading instruction typically look like in Ireland at the moment? Oh, this is a, how long have we got? <laughs> uh, Okay, so, so it's quite interesting. I suppose internationally, in terms of our, our PEARLS results, we would be ra we rank currently quite high in, in, internationally in terms of our reading levels in, in Ireland, particularly at the, the primary school age or at the, around the 10-year-old 10, 10 range. Um, very recently, we've had a new primary language curriculum introduced. Um, so that has taken over from our 1999 curriculum which, you know, it definitely needed a, a, an update. Uh, but what we have done in, in this language curriculum is we've married both English and Irish together into one curriculum. So uh, there's a lot going on. There's a lot at the moment for teachers to get to grips with in terms of implementing a brand new curriculum here, uh, a language curriculum. Uh, and on top of that, now there's uh, a lot of information as you managed to uh, mention there. There's a lot of knowledge out there um, about you know, how children learn to read, um, why children are struggling to learn to read, how we can help them. And um, I suppose in terms of our, our curriculum, um, there are probably a couple of little issues. Again, with the opportunity to introduce a brand new curriculum, you would 
think this is only a couple of years old, all that lovely research we have on reading. And, and for the most case, it's all in there. It's all it has, you know, focuses on reading motivation, reading engagement, phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, phonics. All of those nice five big pillars are all in place there, uh, which is wonderful to see because we didn't have that in our 99 curriculum. There was no mention of phonological awareness or phonemic awareness or even phonics um, in our old curriculum. So it's great to see they're front and center now. So a lot of teachers are going, OK, let, let me find out more about this. Uh, however, there are a couple of little issues in there, such as uh, looking at particular reading um, word recognition strategies. So the good old looking at the picture cues, you know, looking at words in the context of the sentence in order to decode them that I suppose as a teacher educator and a person who's, you know, doing some research on reading, I would rather not see, I suppose, uh, at this particular moment in time. And again, looking at the, the right to read um, report, you know, these are things that we know we shouldn't be teaching children. We shouldn't be drawing their attention to picture cues or, you know, a sentence context when we're asking children to decode text. All we want them to do is look at the word on the page uh, and the letters of the words on the page and uh, to decode those, um, you know, blending them together and sounding out, looking at the letter uh, sound relationships. So a lot going right, um, but also areas that I suppose still need to be addressed. Um, and I think teachers would be happy to have a little bit more support in this particular area, given the sort of uh, the bombardment of information that that's now available. And even as a reading researcher and a teacher educator, you know, it's really overwhelming. Um, the number of webinars out there, the number, you know, all of this noise, uh, and it's fantastic. I mean, before the pandemic, we wouldn't have had access to a lot of the information that's out there now with all the fabulous webinars that are available. But the downside to that is there's a huge amount of information to digest for teachers. And not only that, but in some ways it's, you know, the debate um, sometimes isn't that helpful because although we have all the, this is the science of reading and this is what it is and this is what the research says, I suppose for me, what's really difficult is how that then becomes embedded within teaching. Um, and I think teachers here in Ireland are still grappling with, great, this is the science, this is what it's telling us, but what does this look like in my classroom? Or, or how should this look in my classroom? So I suppose from my perspective as a teacher educator, I, I feel that's probably my job <laughs> is to try to bridge that research with what's happening um, you know, in the classroom and how it can be implemented. So um, I think I've gone way off uh, your actual question. <laughs> gone down my own little route there. But um, yeah, that gives you, I suppose, a snapshot of. But you did bring up some really important things. And there definitely is this huge amount of information out there. And you hear the teachers that are taking the deep dive into the oh. science of reading or structured literacy. And it's amazing that teachers are going and taking their own initiative to get this information that wasn't available to them during their teacher education time. But the problem is the issue of quality control yeah. and uh, wolves in sheep clothing who were part of the balanced literacy, whole language movement and still strongly have the beliefs of teaching reading in that manner, but they're saying that they are aligned yeah. with the science of reading and structured literacy. So it, it's about quality control and not just going, I don't know if teachers pay teachers is a big site over there, yeah. but over here, yes, um, <laughs> it, it, it gets a lot of traffic. Uh, so it's making sure that teachers have access and pre-service teachers have access to the information that they need to succeed. And, you know, I remember reading something recently that said, if you just looked up reading instruction on the psych info database, there's over 14,000 yeah. peer reviewed journal articles in the past 10 years. Now there's no way that a classroom teacher can filter through those and yeah. even necessarily understand the statistical analyses done in these reports. And I know that 
Um, recently, Dr. Uh, Stephen Dykstra brought this up when there was a, a report talking about reading recovery. And he just, you know, l- talked about how, you know, the statistical analyses and the regression equations that were used are valid and they're, you know, important to look at and realize that they are ways of doing things and they are, you know, good models. But unless you have those higher level statistics classes, I mean, that, you know, regression analyses was one of the classes that I took in my PhD. Yeah. And I, I'm not expecting a pre-service teacher or a classroom teacher no. to have that. And it's very difficult concepts to grasp. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you're right, like we've had, uh, and I'm sure it's the same in, in Canada over the course of the pandemic, we have, you know, there's been a huge upsurge in webinars locally for teachers, and it has just been phenomenal. The, the dedication of teachers, it's not the, for the want of seeking knowledge, you know, they were in their hundreds um, signing up for webinars after school in their own time, in some cases, you know, spending their own money to upskill themselves. So there is this feeling that there is a craving for this information and, you know, for the support in delivering a, a, a structured literacy um, or, a, you know, at least instruction that's backed by the science of reading and, and it's evidence-based uh, instructional. So the, the desire is there from teachers. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, but I think, it's, it's an entire system um, piece over here. You know, things have to change from right at the very top, from governmental level all the way down. Um, because I suppose in terms of the, the pre, pre-teacher, we have a um, four-year um, Bachelor of Ed degree. Um, so, and three of those years in my own particular institution, uh, three of those four years, the, the students get input on literacy. Um, uh, the whole way through the year so they get lots and lots of information but I suppose there's a couple of issues the the first is um you know literacy itself is such an expansive area I mean it's huge and when you're trying to cover a gambit from age four to age 12 you know there is just you could take up almost the entire year just talking about literacy and giving instruction in literacy you know development um you know literacy struggles you know there's so much you could just delve into so there's that time element and then in ireland we our primary teachers teach 11 subjects so you know literacy is only one subject within 11 um so just the time isn't there um you know from a teacher educator perspective I, I would happily do double, if not triple, um, the amount of hours if I could on literacy, but we're very much tied into a European framework here. So you have to give particular credits to particular modules. So, I mean, it, it's just the expanse and the time, but there's also a piece I think about, you know, introducing this at the right time for students as well, because a lot of student teachers have, like placement on their heads. So what they want is give me stuff I can do in the class. Um, And you're trying to deliver the sort of the teacher competence, teacher knowledge. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But what do I do when I'm in front of the children in the class? Uh, And we see that here with some of our sort of foundational subjects like, you know, history of education, sociology of education. We see that they don't sometimes see the relevance of that theoretical piece to their teaching. So I think having to be really explicit as to why this information is really important and um, it, it really has to be driven home to, to student teachers. So I think we can give them a lot of that knowledge. Uh, and in my own institution um, in 2020, we introduced a brand new module called Literacy Education, Teacher Knowledge and Competence. And it's very much, I mean, it's, um, I suppose my Bibles for it was good old Louisa uh, Motes and, um, Snow et al, you know, the knowledge um, in support of teaching, of reading. Uh, so we do loads of work on the reading brain and phonology and orthography and morphology, all of that and assessment and reading difficulties. But I think they will only take so much of that in as student teachers. Um, that also has to continue on once they get to a school. Uh, and they have to be hearing that same language from from the teachers within their school and within their professional community, because 
you know, they will drop that. They'll do, okay, I have to study that for my exam. And then, you know, it's kind of forgotten about. So, and there is this, sometimes, you know, they kind of come out of college or on placement and they'll go into a school that maybe isn't as progressive as, you know, some others. And they'll hear things like, oh, never mind what they told you in college. This is the way we do it on the ground and here. And it's, it's like all your hard work <laughs> is wiped out. So I think there is a piece, absolutely, we'll hold our hands up as teacher educators that we have to give the student teachers, absolutely. But I don't think it can stop there. And I don't think we can take the full um, responsibility for it. It has to continue when they get out into that professional community and, and into schools. So um, so they'd be the big, the, the big issues here anyway, in terms of getting student teachers up to speed with the research but but you're absolutely right some of the research reports and it is one of the most studied areas you know within education is is reading and, and how we learn to read so you know for a teacher to have they've no time they don't even have time to plan their own lessons let alone go off and now I'm going to sit down and find the time to read a reading article on a particular topic so we don't get any planning time at all as teachers within our school day to plan so all of that happens obviously you know so you just don't have the time and then again like you said do I have the skills uh to read through you know the statistical part of of uh, no I, I I most definitely I wouldn't have had absolutely not you know prior to to going on and and researching this at a, at a, a deeper level you know it I wouldn't have had the time and I probably wouldn't have had the know-it-all know-it-all to to decipher what I was reading in some cases, you know. Well, and even access to the materials because <gasps> these memberships uh, are expensive and knowing how to access them is a lot. And it, it takes a lot of personal time and investment to do that. Yeah. And I think what you're doing in your, your literacy programs is far superior to the, a lot of the programs that I'm familiar with, everything that you're covering. But I think one thing that needs to be highlighted is a, the vast majority of pre-service teachers that we are working with are ones that were taught to read using a balanced literacy or whole, whole language approach to teaching reading. And a lot of the pre-service teachers are individuals who won't even remember learning how to read. They just remember reading. So if they remember a little bit about how they were taught mm -hmm. and don't remember having any struggle during those early years where they're learning to read and then being given all this additional information about, you know, the science of reading and the reading brain, they might question the relevance and why mm -hmm. can't they just do it how it was done with them. And we have all these quotes and information that's saying that reading is a natural process and not having that critical thinking approach mm -hmm. to looking at this information can be difficult. And it is a lot of information. You know, I've been on this journey a long time and there's still things that I'm learning every day. And, you know, I'll read it yeah. a book on phonemic awareness or phonological awareness, something that I know quite well. I'm like, oh, I never thought about yeah. it that way, right? Yeah. And you know, when you go into the English language, the orthography mm. or the, the printed representation of our words, yeah. it's so deep and there's so many aspects to it. Yeah. And there's no way a teacher education program can go into that depth. Nope. And uh, in, in North America, a lot of our teacher education programs are post-bachelor programs. So they'll have already gotten a bachelor degree in their area of choice and do a one-year or a, a two-year program afterwards. Mm -hmm. So they're only getting, you know, a little bit of time on reading instruction, mm -hmm. but it's not doing that deep dive that's in. And yes, to get into these programs, there is a requirement of English courses, but the English courses you take in university are looking at the literature 
and the poetry and and maybe the writing side of things, but not at the level that's needed for classroom instruction Mm -hmm. in the primary classroom. And again, if it's something that's come easy to you, you Mm -hmm. may not understand the structure. As a dyslexic myself, I remember learning how to read and all the effort Mm -hmm. and all the things that I had to do. But my husband did not have those same issues. And, you know, when working with our children, I'll take one approach and he'll take another approach and I'll go into more of an explanation about why a word is spelled that way. He's like, I never knew that. Okay. (laughs) And so that's, that's kind of the level that I think a lot of teachers are at like, well, it's spelled that way just because it is. Yeah. Yeah. And, And not understanding the deeper way of spelling it, which will work for about 40% of the students. They'll just figure it out. But we need to raise the bar and say that, no, you know what? Research has shown us that we can have 95% of our Mm. students reading at a great reading level, not just, you know, barely literate. Yeah. We want them to be able to read and enjoy, and we need to give them the skills to do that. And Mm. as teachers, we need to learn those deeper meanings we need to learn about syllables and phonemes and articulation oh that's a big one (laughs) all of these avenues and then another topic that is really important to get into that pre-service training especially in the primary years is looking at the screening measures that we can do with students to protect success. And and it's not just in reading and literacy. It's also in numeracy and math. Mm -hmm. And there are things that we can do even with the preschool students at, you know, age four and five that can alert us to potential difficulties and then give us diagnostic, not in the sense of a label or a diagnosis, Mm -hmm. but as ways that we can inform our teaching practices to help these students. Now in a teacher education program, you can learn how to administer these, but it takes years of experience doing it and working with it with the guidance of someone else to help you understand the results and how to implement it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I, so many things are just like ringing in my, I'm just jotting down notes because it's exactly the same for, you know, that first year in, in, in with our student teachers, the very first thing I say is hands up when you remembered you learned to, you know, how you learned to read. And of course they don't because it's such a, a prolonged um, experience that you don't, like very few would remember that light bulb moment where, oh, I can now read, you know, it doesn't happen like that. And then I think there is a complacency, uh, particularly amongst some of the student teachers that, well, I read in English, I write in English, how difficult can it be to teach? You know, so I have a big caveat at the beginning, just because you can read and write in English doesn't mean you can teach it. Um, you know, so we, we do a lot of that unpacking of those kind of assumptions that students have at the very beginning that, and then you have that whole, as you said, that whole deep orthography piece. I mean, do you know that? And what's interesting is when teachers hear a lot about the research and, you know, it makes sense. I mean, you know, it all seems to kind of come to, oh yeah, well that, that you kind of get a lot of those aha moments, particularly from teachers when they hear about the science of reading and the reading brain and that, you know, we don't all need 50 different ways to learn how to read. There's really one way we may have to, you know, change the instruction and have our instruction much more repetitive and much more intensive for some children, but the brain does the same thing, um, you know, in terms of how it learns to read and how it learns to connect the letters and the, and the sounds that represent those letters. So um, the, I suppose the other little issue we have in Ireland, which again, I'm not sure if it's the same um, in, in Canada, is our teachers can teach from infants, which would be the kindergarten right up to sixth class which would be, I suppose, close to sixth grade. So what you sometimes have as well as teachers who've spent a lot of their career up at the senior end of the school, and then suddenly they find themselves, there's a big shuffle and they find themselves down in infants. And as you know yourself, 
I don't need a lot of that information when I'm up in fifth and sixth class about phonemes and but suddenly I'm I'm turfed down to, to you know infants and I I may have done this sometime 10 years ago in in teacher ed college but now you know I don't know what what I need so I almost think there's an argument there as well somewhere for some course some refresher course that you have to do as a teacher if you do come from the senior classes and, and find yourself down at the, the junior end of the school because there's information and, and knowledge that you need particularly at that level that you know you have to have it is absolutely crucial but I, I suppose going on to the, the, the point about the screening, um, this is very much where, where I'm at at the moment. So I'm actually on, um, on leave from uh, my institution at the moment. I'm doing some research leave and I've just got funding for a project to develop a screener um, or at least an assessment that looks at phonemic awareness and, and letter knowledge in particular. So as I was doing my, my master's actually in literacy, I sort of tapped into the area of phonemic awareness uh, and this idea that we have a predictor of, you know, the future, uh, the future potential of a child to become a good reader or, or, you know, to be a struggling reader, that we have the potential to uh, predict this before a child is even introduced to print was just phenomenal for me. It kind of is almost like having this crystal ball and we can, you know, see even before we've introduced print, the children who are already flagging for us that there are issues there. You know, if if I can't blend my words together, now there are so many other um, risk factors as well, which, uh, you know, I, I'm sure we'll get on to. But, you know, if a child is struggling with phonemes, you know, just packing letters and print onto that is not going to help uh, a child in that situation. So we can tell from, you know, or a random optimized naming, we can look at phonemic awareness skills and segmenting and blending and the child's ability to link uh, letters and sounds together and, and to know that relationship really, really quickly and automatically, that we have all these indicators at a really young age to show us, okay, we have to get in there earlier. And I think in Ireland, anyway, that's a big paradigm shift, the idea of prevention rather than remediating later on and and that would be amongst other things one of the big issues I would have with reading recovery is first of all it just happens too late the child has already failed the child also sees themselves as failing like I have had you know five and six year olds tell me they're a really bad reader I mean that is heartbreaking and it's so difficult to come back from you know to to in some way tell that child no you know we can we can make this better we can make this easier for you but we've left it too late if we're waiting for a child to have already begun to struggle with print and um, we've left it too late by senior infants first class here we have to get in you know at that very beginning of, of school to start screening children and as you rightly said screening it's not diagnostic you know, it's something very quick, very informal. Um, and the work I'm doing is looking at a digitized screener. So hopefully that will speed things up even quicker because assessing children's phonemic awareness is difficult. It's long, it's arduous. I have to take the child to a quiet space, one-to-one -one, so they can hear, you know, the sounds that I'm making. If I have 30 infants in my class, I could be taking up to three or four days, instructional days, just to assess the children in this one small little area of literacy. And then I've all the rest, you know, to do as well, their oral language, their writing, their vocabulary. So we have to, you know, find ways of speeding this up. And really in Ireland, we have very little access to screeners. Um, you know, Dibbles would be probably the one that we would have access to, or a cadence as it now is. Um, but we really don't have access to, to screeners. And what happens then is it's very much left up to individual teachers to either use their own professional judgment. Uh, there's a lot of informal observation and um, making notes. But again, I really think we need something consistent, something objective. You know, how can I have a conversation with another teacher about a child's or children's ability if we're using different assessments, if I'm making up my own and I may not 
if I'm getting one off teachers, paid teachers, which is even more worrying. And, you know, or if I don't have the knowledge to make one up myself, you know, it might be just the teacher next door said, oh, this is a good one. And again, it goes back to that critical piece and being critical about everything we use in, in the classroom in relation to, to particularly reading. And obviously it's other subjects, as you rightly said, numeracy and everything, but it's that piece about questioning and being critical of everything that, that we use in terms of children's reading. So, so that piece of that screener that can just flag those at-risk children as early as is humanly possible so that then we have the opportunity to obviously uh, provide early intervention um, and hopefully, as you said, bring children up to at least a proficient level uh, of reading where reading isn't going to be constantly a struggle for them, isn't something that's, you know, has this tied into then their self-esteem, their self-worth. And, you know, we, we know there's huge connections between reading failure and, you know, lots and lots of, of, of a lot of the world's woes and, and society's woes. So we do need to it's, it's that Maya Angelou quote that I absolutely love, that piece of you do the best you can until until you know better. And then when you know better, you do better. Mm -hmm. And we do know better now. So we do need to do better <laughs> as such. Uh, and it's on us now at this point if children are failing to, to read, uh, to learn to read. It, it's on it's on the educational community because we have the information we need. Um, we don't have all the information. That's definitely, you know, this is a, an ever evolving space. And as you said, every day is a school day. I'm learning things about phonemic awareness regularly that, you know, I thought I had this all down past, but, but no, but it is definitely now on us as, as an education system. And um, we know what, what these children need. So we need to, I think in Ireland, wake up a little bit and realize that we're possibly not giving the children what they need at the, this moment in time. And, and we, we can do better, I think. Yeah. And I think, you know, my ideal would be making it so that education follows more of a medical model mm -hmm. in the sense that it doesn't matter whether you get your teacher training in Ireland, in Canada, in the United States, in Australia, there is a standard set of curriculum and expectations that pre-service teachers are coming out with when it comes to reading and math instruction. When we're looking at the science and socials, it, it, that's a little social studies or like history, mm -hmm. that's a little bit more location specific, but there are concepts that teachers need to understand and know and a common language, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to screening. You're going to have the same type of screening if you go into an emergency room or into your doctor's office with a specific complaint. We need to make it so that our children are having the same sort of screening done at that four and five, six, seven-year-old level so that we have that standard set of data looking at phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, rapid automatized naming, word reading fluency, non-word reading fluency, and vocabulary. Those are some of the things that can really help us. And they can be done in an efficient manner, depending on the screening method used. And if we have this data that follows with the student, so that we can look at the evidence and see how the student is progressing. I think that's the best way that we can make sure that there is success for all. One of the books that you brought up is on my bookshelf to actually, the books are, but I wanted to take a moment to talk about Louisa Moats' speech to print. So this covers a lot of the concepts in her letters program mm. uh, that she's a, a co-author of. And when you do that letters training, it's intensive. Mm -hmm. It's several hours of study mm -hmm. and actual implementation and practicum places. So 
understanding that there's so much information that you can get from this one book and realizing that it's something that could take a whole, you know, semester on its own to really do that deep dive Mm. is something that is important to understand and realize that when we're talking about this information, it's not something that you're just going to learn in your pre-service training or your in-service professional development. As an educator, whether you realize it or not, you've signed up to be a lifelong learner. And, you know, the science of reading or structured literacy is not just one program. You can't go to the store, go to Amazon, go to teachers, pay teachers and buy it and have everything you need. It is changing. We are learning more and we're learning more so that we can do better and get it the right the first time with our students. Yeah. And I think we have, we have issues accessing letters in Ireland as well. Uh, There's issues there as well, Mm. but some, um, but yeah. And what I really like about a book like this is I don't know if you have the workbook is really good. So if you want to test yourself, you can use the workbook. But what's really nice is it's that piece I was saying about we can only give them so much as as student teachers at the pre-service level. But Mm -hmm. if I have a book like this as a teacher, you know, I might not need to read about it for a month or two. But if I have something like this, okay, what am I doing? I can, you know, just look it up. The other one that's really good. I don't know if you've uncovering the logic of English. This is a super, again, for a teacher, it's one of those go-to books that just, if you're not sure what, what were the rules around or, you know, syllable types, or, you know, I, I'm going to move on to that later on in the year. Uh, you know, I don't have to sit there and go, oh my God, what do they do with me in college? I can't remember, you know, to have this almost, or these kind of books, almost as little Bibles, you know, on your, oh, I, I, like I haven't this. got that, but I believe that's great. This one goes into phones themes, which is, great because it gives you those little tidbits that some students love. Now, uh, for those, I do see some questions in the chat. We will put the names of the books that we're speaking about in the comments, in the replay. So you can access them and you will be sent a link to the replay. uh, If you signed up for the zoom, uh, edition of this. Otherwise, you can access the replay on the Right to Read Initiative YouTube channel at the Right to Read Initiative website and through the Right to Read Initiative podcast. So this information is not, we're not going to have it typed out for you during the live recording of this, but they will have access to it. Um, the book that I held up is one about phone themes and it's titled SL is for sleaze, but SN is for sneeze, the meaning behind English consonant clusters. Mm. So this is looking at the blends and these are just the little factoids that you can throw in for that incidental learning while you're teaching. And there's some things that kids just get and hold on to, and it helps them understand meanings of words and um, make some predictions when they come across words that they're not too sure about. But I think that's that's a big piece uh, as well that, you know, when you talk about the science of reading, you end up focusing in so much on the phonemic awareness and the phonics, but we have to constantly remember that this is a means to an end. And that end goal is, you know, that whole piece of reading for meaning. If I don't understand what I read, it doesn't matter how well I decode on the page if I don't understand what I'm reading. So obviously we're we're also talking about, you know, morphology, vocabulary, reading comprehension strategies. They are also even at the, particularly at the, you know, we can do work on on morphological endings and and affixes, even at the, the junior infant and that kindergarten piece. So I suppose sometimes it all, and particularly in Ireland, what what is, has happened in the past, and, and I see this sometimes when our student teachers come back from, um, you know, before they go out on placement, they bring in the, the, the timetable and, you know, I have to structure my whole day and I have to structure my English. And they kind of come in sometimes and say, oh, this is my teacher's timetable. He or she wants me to stick to this. And, and what you tend to see is 
you know, lovely reading and writing. And then you see this little box for phonics and it's just sort of out there floating on its own. And, and that has become a problem. A phonics, I think, in Ireland had, had become very much detached from reading and it was out there isolated on its own. Uh, and I would very much drive home to students know that you have to bring that back. Children have to see why learning phonics is relevant to reading. They have to see it in embedded text. They have to see it in sentences. They have to see it within their big book reading that you might be doing during your read aloud at the end of the day. So that idea of sort of decontextualizing phonics and, you know, putting it out there that, you know, it kind of floats out there and nobody really, and then, you know, you've done for the children and then suddenly they see the letter in a book and they're like, I've never seen that before, <laughs> you know, and, and they're not making that link between that phonics instruction and reading. So constantly bringing it back for the children to reading. But, but as I said, there, there's so much more that needs to happen within um, a kindergarten or a junior infant classroom. It can't be just phonics, 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 which in, in other countries, you know, it has gone down that route where there's so much emphasis placed on phonics that you know background knowledge and vocabulary and that all that other part of the the scarborough's rope and um, is sort of kicked to touch or left for for later on up the school and uh, that's something we, we definitely in Ireland we need to make sure that all of that is happening and um, within within the infant classrooms just one other book i don't know oh uh, yes for such yeah. as book this is a great one i think for for teachers who you know the art uh, and science of teaching reading uh, primary reading is a really nice read very practical uh, very accessible as well um so that's another nice one but i, I mean i can put a list of all of these uh, and send them on to catherine and uh, look you have most of them all anyway so <laughs> um but yeah I think we're doing, uh, there's a lot going right. We, we've always had, I think, in Ireland, a strong emphasis on phonics instruction. Oh, to the point where it nearly became just all about phonics instruction at the early years. So for us, I think the science of reading maybe isn't that, you know, oh my God, explicit phonics instruction. We've had that for, for many years through various programs like Letterland and Jolly Phonics. Uh, Jolly Phonics, I don't know if you know of it. It's um. An English program, but it's actually sold more copies in Ireland than it has in England. It's an incredibly popular uh, phonics program, um, and I've developed with my colleagues our own phonics uh, program as well. Sounds like phonics. So I think in Ireland we've always had, or very much in the last couple of decades, we've had a strong focus on on phonics instruction. So we've been doing okay with that, but again making sure it's embedded within reading is uh, we've gone a little bit um isolated with it okay. and decontextualized well and i think you know when when speaking uh with debbie heppelwhite of phonics mm -hmm. international she likes to highlight the importance of the need for explicit phonics instruction mm -hmm. where we are teaching those letter sound correspondences mm -hmm. or grapheme phoneme correspondences explicitly but it's also important to have those implicit lessons that are you know mm -hmm. uh, in those teachable moments mm -hmm. where you're not following the scope and sequence to the letter yeah. but you are taking what's happening in real life in real time and providing that explanation and as a teacher that takes a lot of knowledge and experience and that's where I say I'm constantly learning new things and understanding ways that I can do better when having these explanations for reading and spelling because it's not just knowing your phonics and your morphology it's also looking at the etymology or where the mm. word comes from and English is a very complex yeah. language where we take words from everywhere and understanding that you know these are the rules and the spelling patterns for words that come from English, but when we're mm -hmm. adopting them from other languages, we uh, typically adopt those spelling patterns yeah. that were used in the original language. So it doesn't have that same transparency. And a, a perfect mm -hmm. example would be that in the English language, Q is always followed by the letter U. But in words that we've taken from other languages, it doesn't follow that rule. Yeah. 
And so we have to be careful Mm -hmm. and say, yeah, there are caveats to some rules, but you know, the vast majority of the time, this is how it works. And that's where the logic of English really helps teachers. And, you know, it's a great quick reference guide. I have the, the digital version of it that I got off of Amazon. It's a four hour read. And you know what, if you get the digital one, it even has commonly highlighted areas. Ah, brilliant. (laughs) Brilliant. Yeah. Um, And again, a lot of our students would be similar. They'd be like, oh my God, English is so complicated. You know, there's so many rules and there's so, you know, we've silent letters and we've all, uh, and then when you actually explain the entomology of of a number of particularly silent letters, you know, the bomb and bombard, and, you know, you can see that root and wh- where it came from. And, and it's actually really, I'm a bit of a word nerd, uh, like, you know, it's actually really interesting. And you can get students quite interested in, you know, the etymology of words as well. And um, so again, it's, it's trying to break down this idea that, you know, oh, English is such a complex, it's so, um, it's so irregular, everything is so irregular, you know, no, well, there are actually, um, there are rules that that make a lot of sense or you know there are things we can look at in terms of English that explain why um, particular words are irregular or why they don't follow a particular pattern spelling pattern and so I I think that's part of uh, the course that I really enjoy Uh, and they actually because you again you can see that oh right okay I never thought of it that way or and, and funnily enough sometimes it's the etymology stuff that really sticks and, um, you know, that's the stuff they'll walk away and remember that <laughs> they may not remember, you know, the particular uh, phoneme rules or the particular, uh, you know, pronunciation for a particular letter, which, again, I go through and drill all the pre-school uh, students, uh, the, the teacher students in, uh, you know, I literally stand there with flashcards and, and we practice those sounds because the mu and the ku and the oh, you know, we're just making it sometimes so difficult for children to to learn to blend if we're not giving them that correct pronunciation to begin with, you know. So, uh, no, and that's why those books are lovely to have, just as I said, you know, have a look through them, but then have them on your desk, have them wherever you're doing your planning at home that you can just dive into them and, uh, and uh, pull out these loads of lovely gems. The other one that I'm reading at the moment, oh, I don't have it up here. Is it... Um, beneath the surface of words mm. um that's oh that's a super book I'm really enjoying that one now as well at the moment it's all that etymology and the prefix and suffixes and so um yeah so there's loads of there, there are loads of really good there's loads of really good reading material out there um well and, and I think it's a great Oxford uh publishes a etymology dictionary for kids and it's uh-huh. in my daughter's room at the moment um but it's something that's a quick reference. And, you know, if you just want to do it on spur of the moment, there's even etymology online that gives you that background information. Yeah. I like the heart that the kids want dictionary just because it's already at the level that your students could understand. Yeah. Um, so that's, and then, you know, one that I, I like to, I know it's my, I guess my go-to. And if you've listened to a talk with me about this before, you've probably heard it before, but uh, why is the sound also represented by the grapheme ph and it's because in the greek alphabet there was no letter f and so if it's an academic word or a scientific word you're gonna more often than not have the ph representing the phoneme because they have that greek and latin origin of the word and that's where we're getting the meaning and the spelling from. So when you say that to kids, it just, it just yeah, it's like, it's oh, big. yeah, that, makes, <laughs> that sense. makes sense now. Yeah, right. I don't have to guess anymore. Exactly. Catherine, would you mind just, uh, I know, because I, I would regularly get um, queries from, from teachers looking for, even today, I had one for, you know, just courses that they can do. And I know you... Uh, have a lot on your your website um but they're looking for more information on the science of reading looking for courses they could possibly take could you just give a quick rundown of, of what you have uh, available 
Yes. So I do have a new course called Reading Development Explained. And this course is just meant to be an introductory course into the science of reading. It's for the teachers and the educators that didn't have it as part of their reading instruction. And it does a very explicit, practical way to introducing you to the concepts related to it. It looks at why reading isn't a natural process. And then I go into a deeper look at the simple view of reading, Scarborough's reading rope, uh, Nancy Young's ladder of reading and writing, which shows the different uh, accessibility for learning how to read to students. And then looking at the science of reading, I look at how we read individual words. I talk about those big five things, uh, phonological awareness, phonics, vocabulary, fluency, and comprehension, looking about what it is, what it means, and how you can do it in your classroom. Uh, and then I, I do bring it all together. And it's important to understand that the science of reading or structured literacy, whatever you want to call it, isn't just for your literacy lessons. Like that example that I just gave with, with the PH representing the phoneme, well, that's a perfect one to bring into your science lessons, right? And when we look at morphology, we can bring that into our science, our math, our history lessons, looking at where these morphemes come. Uh, then it ends up with a little bit on screening. So that's available at garfortheducation.com. If you are interested, you can always message me about it. Um, but sorry, the other thing that I wanted to mention is you're talking about this comprehension piece of the reading rope being left for other parts. And it's very important that we take time to include that comprehension piece at the earlier levels from the beginning. Uh, and it looks different. Yes, at the beginning school years and the, you know, the kindergarten grade one. So, that, you know, from ages four to seven, when we're really teaching reading, that's our focus is teaching students how to read. The focus of the comprehension is different when we look at that eight to 12 range when we're starting to show them how to read to learn. And tomorrow, actually at 4 p.m. Pacific, I'm going to be speaking with Lynn Givens uh, from Connect Comprehension. And we're going to be looking at how we can include those comprehension lessons and strategies from the beginning to the end and building it across things. Um, so that's a great opportunity to learn more about that. And for those of you in, uh, Europe there, again, it will be available as a replay and as a podcast later on for you to reference. Now, I did want to take a moment to address a couple of the questions and comments that we have had. So one says, I'm an Iris teacher looking at SOR for the science of reading. And I understand the problems with the three queuing system for early readers. But as they progress and begin to read more words, are the cues not relevant? For example, if you picked a sentence like, I read the book for homework, or I have to wind the bobbin up, so many of those words aren't decodable as a usual sense. You would need to understand the context in order to get the words right is this is what I'm finding difficult. I would love to hear your thoughts. And I mean, the first thing that jumps out of me at that is looking at pictures is not going to tell you what those words say. You are using your comprehension of the sentence that you are reading to dictate how you pronounce the word, but you do need to have your phonics or your knowledge of the English orthography and the possible pronunciations to read that. So you're using the context of the sentence to understand how to pronounce it, but a good reader will be able to 
identify the most common pronunciation, then as they read the sentence, they'll go back and reread and read it correctly. And it's important when we look at the studies of how people read the eye movement, it's not a steady stream right to left onto the next line. It's back and forth. So while you're reading, your eyes are doing this, and it may actually help you with the pronunciation as you're reading. And that's where that comprehension and vocabulary piece are so important. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. So that that wind, wind, yeah. you know, that's exactly it. You go to the 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 orthography you go to the word first and then afterwards then you're using the context if you need to to figure out the pronunciation as Catherine says but I suppose where some of the confusion comes in then is if I'm teaching vocabulary to children well then particularly as I move up through the school and as children become more fluent readers well then I will use or I will, you know, teach the children to use the context of the sentence as a strategy to figure out the meaning of words but not the reading of the word, if you if you know what I mean, they will need to use the context of a sentence to figure out what a word might mean. So I might use that as a strategy for teaching vocabulary uh, and the meaning. But in terms of decoding, no, it's always the first port of call is the word itself uh, and decoding that word. And then if I need to, then if there are multiple, uh, is it wind, is it wind? Well, then I will need to figure out, I'll need to read the rest of the sentence to figure out which pronunciation it is. So in the decoding piece, it's, 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 it's the word and, and the, the letters and that decoding each, uh, the pronunciation first. And then we come to the context if we need it to support it. Yeah. And those are cases where we're looking at synonyms. So they're words that are spelt the same, but they mean different. And we are still, we're not telling the student to guess based on context. We are telling them to look at the words. And I know one program calls it um, sparring. So you're, you're sparring between the pronunciations for that vowel sound. Is it I as in wind or is it I as in wind, right? And so you're trying to decide based on the context of the sentence, which pronunciation is best. You are not guessing you are making a hypothesis and informing your decision based on context. That is not using three cueing. That is using the information that you have in the sentence and presenting, and you are being like a word scientist or a word detective, uh, I think some people call it. So there is a question saying or asking if we could explain a bit more from the right to read inquiry and the problems with reading recovery. Is it just three cueing? I am going to say that it's not just three cueing. It's looking at the evidence in how it is taught. And I, I had mentioned earlier about um, the comment that Dr. Stephen Dykstra had about research that has been published that when we look at it in practice, it isn't providing the long-term benefit for students that we need to be seeing. And while it is effective for some students, there are some students that will learn how to read through reading recovery, but it's not all students that are at risk and experiencing reading failure. It is important that we do not put students in a situation where we say, look, I know you're struggling with reading, but we have this great program and you're gonna learn how to read. And then they do it and they don't. That is detrimental to their self-esteem and has a huge impact on their long-term mental health. As I've mentioned in this presentation, I am an individual who is severely dyslexic and I did the reading recovery program when I was a child and I failed. It did not teach me to learn how to read. And that is something that was very difficult for me to process because I had all these promises mm. and then to have them let down. Reading recovery is a very expensive program. Mm. 
that is charged on a per student basis and requires a lot of intensive training for the implementers. This money can be spent in a different manner that provides the training to the teachers on how to give an effective intervention to their students as a one-off sort of thing. So they're getting the training, they learn the strategies and they can use it with every student that they have afterwards instead of having that big cost as a per student product uh, every year. I mean, yes, you're gonna have to buy some materials and whatever for subsequent students, but it's not that same big dollar sign. And school districts and schools are spending millions of dollars a year on these programs. And that money can be better spent to help more students and more teachers in the long term. Would you have anything to add to that? Yeah, Catherine, again, it's that, that again, that research that came out just at the weekend of the ERA conference on the long-term benefits, it's just not showing that. And if you think about it, if I got to spend 30 minutes with a child every day, I would make improvements regardless what I taught them or how I taught them. You are going to, you know, make some improvements on a child if you have that intensive piece but yeah, it's a lot of the strategies that are being taught are strategies that we know struggling readers use. So why are we teaching strategies to struggling readers that we know struggling readers use, like looking at the picture, guessing from context, you know, looking at the leveled predictable readers and not making use of decodable text where children actually get to practice the, the phonics instruction that they're receiving, that they get to practice that to a point where it becomes automatic and fluent for them. Um, and for me, the big one as well is it's, it's just too late. It's too late in a child's reading development and reading trajectory to let them fail before we, we step in. And we know we, we can do better than that now. We can, we can implement interventions earlier and in, in, interventions that are very targeted, that are systematic, that are explicit and you know bring you know that phonics although it is a part of the reading recovery there is some that say it isn't it is but it's incidental and you know in some cases it's sort of the last resort sometimes and in fairness i don't like talking about reading recovery too much without having somebody from that almost angle to to debate it as well but uh, yeah, I think everything you've said, Catherine, and, and that piece that it, it's too late. It's we could be doing better with those resources, I think, for our struggling readers. Definitely. Now, this is a question that you're going to have to answer because I'm not familiar with the Irish perspective. Um, but it's saying, are there any phonological awareness screening tests that you would recommend for four and five year olds in Ireland? And how would you rate the two P's assessment? Yeah, I was going to mention the two P's, but the problem with the two P's is it's very uh, laborious. It, it takes an awful lot of work. Um, and I suppose if you hopefully uh, listen out for Alpaca, that's the name of the project that I, I'm working on. Uh, it's an 18, 18 month project. We are ready to run a year long trial in schools where you will have a digital tool that assesses children phonemic awareness and letter knowledge as well. Um, the Dibbles is there. Um, there's, there's, there isn't a lot. I'm using the, the PIPA as part of, of, of my study and I'm comparing Alpaca to the PIPA, which is the um, preschool and primary inventory of phonological awareness. But again, the issues with it are, it, you know, it, it takes an awful long time to sit one child down one-to-one -one and work through a, a lot of these assessments. As Catherine said, if you have the knowledge, you can create your own, but this is the piece. It's, it's being comfortable that you have the knowledge to, to create a, an assessment of phonemic awareness and phonological awareness. We have a huge over-reliance in Ireland, I think on textbooks and workbooks, like huge, huge uh, over-reliance on it. And I think part of that is because the support isn't there for teachers in giving them the knowledge that they need um, to be more knowledgeable practitioners in terms of literacy. And, and I in no way blame the teachers for this one, you know, with 11 subjects to teach and the time that's given over and the lack of time for planning and the lack of support that's there in terms of bringing teachers up to speed with the, 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 the likes of the science of reading. But 
um, they'd be the, the, we have very, very little. I mean, there might be somebody else out there who has used one. Uh, and if you have, maybe pop it into the chat, but they'd be the, the, the main sort of the standardized normed tests. Uh, the PIPA is normed on a UK um, cohort. So that's why I'm using it. Most would be uh, normed on a US or Australian or, um, you know, sample. So that's why I'm using uh, the PIPA. But there isn't a there isn't a lot <laughs> out there. Um, is the C top two available there? Mm, the comprehensive test yeah, of, yeah. Of the processing. That is a good one. Again, these are expensive tests to purchase as well. You're talking four hundred euro for the likes of the C top. Uh, but that is another really good one. That that is a, a really strong focus on obviously the phonological and and what I would say to to teachers to try to get to the phonemic awareness. The phonological is good. It's, it's grand, but to try to get to the phonemic awareness piece that I, identifying phonemes, blending, segmenting. If you're in the older classes, the the sort of manipulating uh, of phonemes. Don't spend too much time on the, you know, the syllables. Okay, they're important, but what we really want to see is can they identify those phonemes and, and can they blend and segment and, and manipulate those uh, at the phoneme level uh, to really indicate the children who, who, might be, who might be struggling. Yes, and um, I mean, the one thing that I always like to come back to is um, Dr. Nadine Gam. Mm. Sorry, Nadine Gab highlights the importance of, you know, it, it is honestly better to get one that is created and normed. Um, I know in Canada, we have the issue that a lot of our tests are not normed based on Canadian population. Yeah. yeah. But when we're looking at skills like phonemic awareness and rapid automatized naming. These are the skills that are very predictive. And even, you know, you're looking at your word reading fluency mm -hmm. uh, and non-word reading fluency activities. These are things that even though it's not normed on a population based on your demographics, you're still looking for a certain level of skills and understanding of these concepts. Mm -hmm. And whether you're in Ireland, in Australia, in Canada, in wherever, you still need a certain level of phonological awareness and phonemic awareness and rapid automatized naming, word reading fluency. That is going to be a big predictor of where you are. And I know one of the recommendations that Dr. Nadine Gab made at, uh, when she was speaking about the right to read um, report and its recommendations is the importance of a, a higher group, like a, a district or a board of education that oversees a number of schools to go through and proof a number of different screening assessments that they feel are appropriate for that population that look at those key areas. Yeah. And I actually had pulled out uh, an article that I thought was really, really useful. It's Nadine Gaba and Jakob Petcher. Um, it's really nice. There isn't a huge amount of statistics or anything. It's the screening for early literacy milestones and reading disabilities. It's the why, when, whom, how, and where. Uh, and it's just really practical looking into the whole area of screening. And again, it's that consistency and that objectiveness. There's no bias there. I can talk to the teacher beside me in the next room if we both implemented, you know, the same assessment to all our children. Whereas it's very difficult to make decisions, to plan, particularly as a, a special educational needs teacher or team, if different teachers are using different assessments to assess the children in front of them. So uh, I know Nadine Gab has done, uh, they've done loads of work on early bird, again, not available in Ireland. <laughs> so um, uh, again, we're, 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 we're coming around, but we, we need to come around to these things, I think uh, a little bit faster now at this point. And, um, and I'll, I'll put the link to that um, article. Uh, it's really, really nice. It's a, it's a really nice read and it gives a really good insight into screening uh, for early literacy as well. Yes. Now, one of the um, people mentioned that the year two is normed on Irish children by Dr. Mm -hmm. Coogan. I'm not familiar with that test. 
I'm not familiar with the test, but I do know the work of, of Dr. Coogan. All right. So uh, I must look into that actually a bit more. It's year two or something, isn't it? I think. Um, uh, year two R, sorry. Yeah. Yes, two R. Yeah, no, that's, that's good advice for anybody out there. I haven't used it myself, but I will have to look into it. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I've really enjoyed our conversation and I think we've covered a a lot of really great (laughs) concepts. We will make sure that the books and papers that we discussed in this conversation are in the notes for you to refer to. And thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, uh, Catherine. It was lovely to to meet you and lovely to uh, have a chance to chat about all of these literacy issues and amazing to see it's the it's the same issues across the board, no matter where you are, it seems. But uh, Gurumil Mahogat, and thanks so much to everyone who's joined us this evening.